Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. Well then, Heineken Champions Cup weekend to discuss Roy O'Connor of the Irish Independent here in studio and Matt Williams on the line. Evening, Matt. Evening, Joe. Good Evening, to have Rory. you with us. Good to have you with us. So let's start with uh, the game you were at, Rory, over the weekend and we covered on the TV as well, Matt, so it's the obvious place to start. Northampton 16, Leinster 43. Chris Boyd, I think Rory had some interesting comments about going in at the break when it was just a three-point game and we thought we have an interesting one here. Yeah. And his sense looking at his team was the second half won't be pretty. Yeah. He said, after that, he said, there's four or five teams in Europe who can play at test match intensity and we're not one of them yet, but Leinster are. He was, you know, this is a two, uh, super rugby uh, co winning coach with the Hurricanes who's seen a lot of rugby over the years, brought through a lot of the best players in the world in New Zealand and he was mightily impressed with what he saw, what his team were up against on Saturday and, and you know, you couldn't help but not be when watching Leinster in full flow. They were awesome and, you know, Leo Cullen made a couple of big calls, a couple of brave calls. Um, and he was rewarded by every one of the players that he picked ahead of the players that were probably got a, a good away win, the kind of away win in Leon that most Irish teams will be happy for in the past. And what I was struck by in Leon two weeks ago was how I'd written a report that was kind of like, you know, a, a Leinster dogged it out, market champions kind of thing. And you went down and they were so annoyed with themselves that they hadn't been able to rise above what Leon threw at them. And they spoke about reintegrating their team, you know, the two teams that they have, this Pro 14 team that's winning every week and playing quite good rugby and these World Cup players who are coming back after Japan and trying to learn the Leinster systems again. And it looks like they clicked on Saturday. Porter comes in, it's brilliant. Larmer comes in, is possibly you know, one of the best fullbacks in Europe at the moment. Um, James Gibson Park comes in, doesn't let the show down at all with Luke McGrath watching from the bench. Uh, Devon Toner was excellent, you know, and uh, there's one more that slipped my mind at this stage. Oh, Caelan Doris comes in for Max Deegan, two young players, and Doris was outstanding and mm -hmm. played his way into the Ireland thinking with one in, in 180 minutes. So it was mildly impressive, and it just means that they've got five players who were basically dropped for this game, stewing all week, who can come in and freshen things up against Northampton, or may come in over the course of Christmas when they've got three Interpros, and they've got 30 to 40 players, mm. because there's a whole team that went out and hammered, North or not hammered, but beat Glasgow away last week that they left at home. And they're in this unbelievable place, and really there's only two or three teams in Europe who can match them, and none of them are in their pool. Does any part of you, given the World Cup that we've just had, not look at a performance like that in the Champions Cup, and you're talking about how good these various players have been, start to scratch your head a bit and wonder are we just overestimating what Leinster are doing? As you said, they could make 12 changes from the week before. They have basically an international standard team. The country's talents are spread across four provinces as opposed to Northampton trying to ply their trade in the Premiership. And we're just getting a bit too excited by these performances. And we need to judge them maybe against the lower level that they're coming up against. Leinster won't be judged until May. When, and if they lose, if they don't win this competition, they'll be judged harshly. You know, there's really only two teams, three t teams who have the same strength and depth. And Saracens showed that they're close to having that depth on Saturday in Thoman, later on on Saturday in Thomond Park. Absolutely, it's not a pass for the World Cup to say that Leinster were excellent at the weekend, but Leinster are doing things really, really right. They have this incredible flow of players. They're lucky to have the the structures in place that they have. Yeah. You know, some of it is down to them. Some of it is down to the fact that they have these elite schools that are able to basically have little mini academies that feed into this. So I think you can say one without getting away from the other. I think Leinster are, are an achieving entity in their own right. They, you know, they've won one European Cup in the last two years. They got to the final in the other. They've won the Pro 14 both times. They play excellent rugby. Their culture seems to be, apart from a couple of very high profile disciplinary aspects at the end of last season, which they say they've dealt with, mm -hmm. their culture is generally, their rugby culture certainly is very good mm -hmm. and very strong. They've got, they're very well coached, very well managed. They seem to do everything right. And what I came, I mean, one of the things you just came, came down from the stand waiting for the media, like, how did those players end up playing so badly and so inaccurately in Japan? They just, I mean, we might get to that a little bit later on because we have had more about that in the last well, while. Maybe they're but, against better players and under more pressure a lot of the time. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And they're in more high pressure environments. It's a much more high pressure environment. And they're comfortable in Leinster and they're comfortable again, away to Franklin's Gardens. They know they can win in that place. But, um, and set, the whole thing is set up in their favour as well. They can rest players, as you say, and, you know, they play one team in one competition and another in the other. But you still have to sit, sit back and recognise they went away to the t top team in the English Premiership, coached by a very, very good coach, with a couple of really good players in the team and scored seven tries and absolutely emasculated them. Um, and are probably the favourites to win this competition. It's starting to feel like it. Matt, the performance in overall terms, firstly? 
well, it was magnificent to watch, magnificent to uh, to behold. It, it was a gr- it was the best game we've seen so far at club level. First half was just enthralling. Um, you know, full credit to Northampton for coming out and standing toe to toe with Leinster and playing such a wonderful game. Uh, and I think their their uh, their coach that spoke so well. I mean, he's learning about the Northern Hemisphere too. Uh, Super Rugby, uh, you get three or three months preparation. So you, you know, the players finish around, depending where they are, October, your you national players are away, and then you get a couple of months before the season starts. So their conditioning is up. You know, we're in the Premiership and the French top 14. They're only getting like a month's pre-season, maybe less than that. And they have to play every week. And one of the things that people don't haven't really got their head around is that when the Leinster players or the Munster players have a week off, they're actually training harder than the weeks they play because they don't have to perform on the Saturday. They don't have to peak. They don't have to be rested. They can be uh, better recovered and train harder, which means they're fitter. You only have to look at the physiques on the props around the top four team through the French teams and the English teams to see they're all overweight the majority of them, mm. except the guys that have been in the national side. Now, Eddie Jones got under huge criticism a couple of years ago saying he didn't feel the English players were anywhere near fit enough. And now all the clubs are complaining the players are coming back boot up. But Eddie Jones recognised this. Now, the Northampton guys, to their credit, stood toe to toe for about 38 minutes. And then they just could There was nothing left in the tank. And Leinster were just superb. They scored three tries... You know, those championship minutes just before halftime. I know you hate that term, Joe, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> just before halftime, just after halftime. In eight minutes, they scored three tries. Game over. Yeah. And then that pressure built on Northampton. You could see them. I think they dropped the ball or turned the ball. Dropped the ball four times. I think there was six turnovers in the length of 22 where their, their scoreboard just weighed on their, their mind. But Rory's description is, is absolutely spot on. Leinster were awesome. They were Leo Cullen. His decisions were were. I, I was, well, when I saw them, oof, okay, all those on the bench. And every selection was proved that Leinster, uh, that Leo knows his Leinster players better than all of us on the outside yeah. because they were superb. We'll uh, come really, to, really superb. Yes, for sure. We'll come to some of those selections because I do want to get a sense from you if they're going to be reoccurring teams across the season. I suspect in some cases they will. But we should just mention Josh van der Fleer, Matt. I mean, the downside of the red hat is that referees can see him and ping him. The upside is when he's having a game like he generally tends to have at the moment, we all get to notice him in amongst the action. This guy's becoming a real serious talent. He, he, he was immense. We, we used to always joke when someone wears a red scrum cap, we used to call it a selection cap and do it to be noticed. Mm. You want the selectors to notice you. Josh doesn't need to wear that. He, he was absolutely brilliant in attack and defence, as he has been, to be fair to him, uh, in, in the whole Champions uh, Champions Cup. There was one particular moment there uh, in, in the second half where he chased back uh, a br- on a break, made a wonderful diving tackle, slid to his feet, used the momentum of the, the uh, ball carrier, slid to his feet and was straight on the ball and forced a turnover. Mm. I mean, it was just textbook, uh, classical, open side, uh, technique, aggression, desire. And and that's one other aspect, and it's interesting, the Leinster players mentioned it, the Leinster defence in the second half was just superb, it was absolutely brilliant, and Josh was at the heart and soul of that in every aspect, as were the Leinster players. They weren't letting Northampton in. They were they were fighting, they were rushing, they were urgent, as they were in Lyon, but th- that was a real hallmark of, uh, of a team that prides itself on performance, not just getting a result. They, they had a pride in how they perform and they showed it. And uh, Van der Fleur, mate, wow, he, he's, uh, he's one of the great form back rowers in the world at the moment. He sure is. And Rory, you know, he's come back from a serious injury. It's not like he's new on the scene, but it certainly feels as if he's peaking. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sure the World Cup block has helped a lot of those players to get to their physical peak. Um, and I do think that at the elite, elite level against your Saracens and, and when you're playing against England, he sometimes struggles for, for size. And he's also possibly the nicest person I've come across in rugby. I thought Reese Ruddock was. Reese is up there. Yeah, there's a few of them, but he's just a really, really decent, nice guy, which is, you know, not a complaint about someone, but you're, you don't want the nicest guy in your squad to be your seven. Um, and I think there's a little bit, and maybe it's a World Cup being annoyed at what happened in Japan and, and all of that sort of stuff, but I saw a little bit more nastiness about him on Saturday. Not 
uh, ill-discipline nastiness, but just a bit more bite. Okay. And that turnover that Matt referenced, that's something that maybe he's always talked about trying to bring into his game, but he's not as good over the ball as, say, a Dan Levy. And Dan Levy has that bit of bite about him. He has that bit of um, aggression that, that Josh has, has always, I think, lacked a little bit. He's a brilliant player, mm. really quick. His tackle technique is excellent. It's one of the best in the game. And if you can just add that layer of just like Peter Romani style um, aggression, it would give you know it would bring him onto the Sam the, the the Curry Underhill kind of level. But I still think he's a I think at this competition he's one of the best in it. Mm. But there are a couple of players who have what he has, but also have that nastiness. And and you don't want him to not not be a nice guy anymore off the pitch. But when he crosses that white line, I think he just needs to become a bit more yeah. um, selfish, a bit more uh, aggressive and, and, and bring a bit more of that. Is that a fair point, Matt, briefly? Yeah, I, I think it's a very accurate assessment. Okay. Of, I don't know Josh as a person, so I can't speak about whether he has that lack of, uh, uh, of, of a, uh, aggression in him as a, as a human being. I mean, your, your, open, your open side flankers tend to be your psychopaths and sociopaths in your team, you know, like it, it's where rugby's great in a school, you know, you find you find your lunatic sociopath and put him in a seven jersey. <laughs> if you do it on the rugby field, your headmaster will love you. <laughs> Things that get you expelled off the field they love. But it's he's just in really good form. And, and a lot of these guys, especially Irish guys, and, and uh, the, the, the genetics of, of uh, Celtic genetics, sometimes you do get people that are around a long time, but they don't peak until they're 24, 25 sometimes in the props 26, 27. Now, obviously, we're seeing a lot of the, the now current guys like Ryan and Porter that are in the tight five that are very young men. But maybe it's just the time for him to, to um, really grab his chance. And uh, he, his form post-Japan has been uh, outstanding. Mm. He's Dutch, is he? His grandfather was Dutch. Grand came over to work in the Cadbury's factory in Kulak in the 60s, I think. Good man. The family have stayed ever since. So a few of the interesting selections which caught our eye. We'll come to you first, Rory. You can talk to us about what you make of these briefly or which one caught your eye the most. Obviously, the larmer Carney thing is probably going to continue. Now, Larmer did his chances no harm going forward. Yeah. Furlong Porter and McGrath Gibson Park. What are we looking at here? Furlong is Porter is one of those that I think we maybe should have seen at the World Cup at some stage. I'm not saying for quarterfinal start, but Porter was brimming. Every time he came into the pitch, he was just physically at his peak. And Furlong, just over the last 10 months, hasn't been the, the player that we all saw in the Lions. Maybe a bit like Jack McGrath. He used to play a lot of 60, 70 minutes. Maybe that takes it out of you. But maybe having a, a period like Keane Healy of, of being out of the team for a while will bring him back to his level. I think Porter, I think, well, look, the, the, you would often, in a back-to-back -back fixture scenario, you would often rotate your props. And there's no, absolutely no that drop, really, between Furlong starting next weekend. So I'm not sure we'll see it next weekend. But I think Porter's a live, a live contender to start against... Uh, against Scotland on February 2nd, if he keeps this up. Um, he's a breakdown threat as well. He's possibly not the carrier the Furlong is. Um, what was the other one you asked me? At nine. At nine. Gibson Park, is, is. I think there's not much between those two. I think McGrath, I think if you're, say, away in France or something like that, I think if it's a stodgy pitch, McGrath is much more controlling, whereas Gibson Park's one of those players, like Albie Matthews, who was down in Munster, you can bring on for the last 20 minutes and change the pace of the game, change the, you know, add a little bit of width to your pass. I don't think there's a huge amount between them, but it depends on the game you want to play. I don't think... Um, yeah, I think I think you could happily start either of those and not really drop much. Um, I'm, with Conor Murray still not anywhere near his best, uh, Gibson Park is another who's now Irish qualified and comes into the equation for for a Six Nations spot, which in a, now a very very yeah. wide but quite narrow field. We'll come to John Cooney. Where is Gibson Park in that equation? Where does he pitch in? At what level? Uh, I think there's about four players. I think there's Cooney and Murray. McGrath's close to them. Marmion's injured at the moment. He's probably around K Caelan Blade, but consider the way he can come in and change a game. Mm. If Andy Farrell wants, like, Joe Schmidt's bench was often quite about kind of let's see how to lead and make good decisions and defend quite well. If Farrell wants players who can come in and affect the game and change the way Ireland play with 20 minutes to go, well, Gibson Park's probably the best mm. uh, player to up the pace, up the tempo, and the way they say an own red and used to. So I think he's got a shot, but it's... A, it's it's quite tough picking your, your three scrum halves for your Six Nations squad right now. Yeah, for sure. And then Jordan Lar Larmer, Matt, what are, what are we seeing? Because I, I distinctly remember, was it November International against Argentina when he was given a go at full back and a few high tricky balls. I think one of them bounced even. And it was just a tricky afternoon for him. And it was difficult to know at that point how long it would take to get him up to certainly international speed at full back. Where is he in his development? Because he obviously caught the eye on Saturday. Yeah, he's really come on. In the, really, the last six months since since uh, 
since the end of last season. And it takes a long time. Again, you can't want to say a long time. Each player is different on on their development and being settled into a position. As soon as we saw Jordan Lama when he was in the Leinster squad a few years ago, every one of them, every single guy I spoke to just went, wow, this kid's got pace. He's got great footwork. He, he, he can kick. You know, he's not scared. What a physique. Can tackle. He's he's going to be it. And he, on the wing, he was fine. But everyone knew he could be a fullback. Yeah. But when, when you moved him that one position, he didn't play well. And he was out of position by a metre. He got sidestepped. I think it was in one of the Champions Cup games at, at the end of uh, his first season. There. He was just out of position. And the thing at fullback, you can be a metre wrong and you look like a complete goose. It's it's just such an unforgiving position. And we've been spoiled for a long time with having, you know, if you go back even to, to, to Gervie Dempsey, who was probably the best positional fullback of all time. He, he In my days, he taught Robbie Carney. Robbie Carney's positionally excellent. And and then we're, when you get a kid that's a metre or two metres out or just not confident, it, it looks bad. He's developed and learnt and moved forward. What he brings is what a 34-year-old Robbie Carney can't bring anymore. He's been so good, Rob Carney, so consistent. And I am never going to say a word against him because he's just given his all for Leinster and Ireland and, he, and he's beyond criticism. But he is, he is in his mid-early 30s. And what Lama has got is gas and footwork. and You just can't coach that. That's either there or it's not. Yeah. Once he's got his positional play right, when you put that footwork and gas in, He's got he's got the number fifteen jersey for Ireland now. There's no there's no doubt about that. He's he's got it now. Doesn't mean we've seen the end of Rob Carney for Leinster, and it doesn't mean if there's an injury he won't come back for, for Ireland. But you know I think there is going to be a changing of the guard, and we just saw the reason why on uh, on Saturday. Okay, well, the reverse fixture is five fifteen the Aviva Stadium. I know Northampton managed to spring a surprise and this back-to-back -back week a couple of years ago. It feels unlikely at this vantage point, I have to say. To Munster then, and a 10 points three win over Saracens, conditions were awful if people didn't see the game. The weather deteriorated badly, especially in the second half. It was, it was really grim. Van Grant said you were better off not having the ball. But a 10 points to three win against an understrength Saracen side, a Toje travel, but really that was it from the English international contingent. On the face of it, you look at it and say, well, this is very bad for the competition. And if you were one of the Munster fans who paid 75 plus euro for one of the tickets, they're getting very expensive now, then you might feel slightly aggrieved at not seeing Saracens full strength. Equally, you may be happy Munster won. So you, you kind of think, well, what were, is this good decision on Saracens' part? But you look at the pool, they're still right in this, really. Yeah. Like, I mean, Racing 12, Munster 11, Saracens 6. Saracens have Racing and obviously Munster at home. Munster have to go away to Paris and Saracens this weekend. Like, if Saracens gear up and come locked and loaded for the rest of this campaign, Munster are on the back foot here, Rory. Absolutely, no, Munster are in trouble. Um, I, I don't agree with the Saracens' uh, criticism. To a I agree with the criticism of their salary cap stuff. I completely accept all that. Disrespecting the competition I, stuff. Um, I don't... They had... How many... Was it seven players who started? Or five, six, seven players who started a World Cup final six, what, five weeks ago? Mm. They always had to manage their squad. They were never going to be full full whack throughout this tournament. I mean, the first round of this tournament only started two weeks after the World Cup final. So they always were in it. I mean, it would have been... The, the provinces would be resting players now had Ireland gone on and, and got to a semi-final or a final. That's just the reality of what you have to do with your players over a course of a season that's not going to finish until the middle of July. Um, and they've done it quite cleverly. He picked Atoje. You know, he, he put a senior player in amongst a less experienced pack. You know, their second row was Atoje and Will Skelton who were skittling players for fun when they got the ball. Um, and I think Munster should be quite disappointed with themselves that they weren't at least able to get 4-0 out of that game. 4-1 is, is it's not a bad result, but having drawn, two, you know, got two points apiece out of the yeah. Racing game, and they were lucky to get that in, in many ways, because Racing, for long periods of that game, were very, very dominant. I know they could have won it with the Hanneran thing at the end, but that almost glossed over a pretty dominant Racing performance. And now to have to go to two 4G pitches at the home of the European champ, the two teams that have beaten them in the last three semi-finals, um, needing to win at least one and get a lo losing bonus out of the other, with Ra with Sa Saracens bringing back uh, a group of rested England internationals who have just been mm. roundly insulted by the from the island of Ireland for the last while, plus with a chip on their back on their shoulder from the the salary cap thing in the first place, the first time they've got the gang all back together, mm. that's tough. 
and that's going to be tough for Munster yeah. uh, to get a result. I mean, the last time they were over there was, I think, 2013 or 2014, and they were beaten absolutely out the gate, and they probably had a stronger team then than they do now. I mean, and Saracens are stronger now than they were then as well. So um, you'd be a bit worried about Munster's prospects. I mean, that was that was an opportunity on Saturday, and while they won, mm. they didn't take it with the to the, uh, the extent that they probably should have. No, and they leave themselves open to... Saracens having the upper hand in the head-to-head -head should have come down to it at Absolutely. the end of this pool. So Matt, if you take the, the Munster performances at home both at the weekend, again admittedly in terrible conditions, but at the weekend and then against Racing, these two key home European fixtures, everybody uh, has pinpointed and probably enjoyed seeing the beginnings of Larkham's influence in the team, but they also need to win these games and they're not doing it. Are you, are you identifying uh, weaknesses in these two performances? Well, I think you have to split them up a bit be simply because of the conditions. I mean, the conditions were very, very bad and it, it was very difficult to play. I don't think either side uh, played the conditions as well as they should. I know the wind was so strong, sometimes you can't control your kicks mm. uh, with that. But I ideally, with a win like that, you play the whole game 15 metres from your opposition try line. And I, I don't think they did that. I and mean, there was a lot of play midfield um, that they, they, where they could have accumulated a lot more points in that first half than they did. Uh, go, and, and uh, you know, Saracens hit the posts for kicks twice. Look, but for me, uh, I can see Larkham's influence positively in their attack. I can see what they're trying to do. It was a very difficult night la the other night. But it's really their defence that is letting them down. Uh, uh, I've said this so many times, and we're seeing the same defensive system from Munster in the last few years. They're standing their nine, Connor Murray, in the defensive line. Now, that's, that's, I fully understand the reasons why you do that and what, what the pluses are in that if you have more people in the line. But it leaves only one man working in the backfield on their current system. And what we saw Racing do was cut them apart by short kicks. When you've only got one guy there. And, and when, when Finn Russell kicked, there was no one in the backfield. Right, they had one line. Uh, Haley was out of out of position, and uh, the, the the there was zero people behind that line. If they keep doing that, and they did this in Bordeaux at a semi final last year, and it was different. Racing just got behind the line with a run, uh, passed to a support player, just drew and passed the one guy. You can't have one one man in your secondary in, in against these uh, wonderfully gifted sh uh, players who have a short kicking game. You've got to have people working their bum off. It's hard to get two and three people in that secondary line. Now, if Munster keep doing that, they'll lose. Mm. They're also missing first up tackles in their front with their front guys. You saw against Racing, there was uh, Peter Amani and one of the guys made a bad choice and they just went straight through. You, you can't miss your first up tackles. Now, what Saracens are going to do when they come in as Rory's rightly suggested, full tilt. I think they'll, Saracens will pick a full squad this weekend. Mark uh, uh, McCall has said as much. Uh, it, if we remember that semi-final last year, the, the Saracens forwards in tight absolutely ripped them apart, just ran at them, ran at them, ran at them. They crossed the game line and scored tries. They box kicked and uh, Munster didn't handle the box kick well. Mm. And then they just got in behind with short kicks. Now, unless they can find a way to fix up this defence it's going to fall apart. Now, having said that, if they hadn't have given away a bonus point, a losing bonus point to Saracens last week, it might be a bit better for them. But I, I think by just giving that one point away, get the Saracens getting the, the losing bonus point, it's it's almost impossible. Look, now, it's not, nothing's impossible in the game of rugby, but if you're crystal balling it now, you've got to say they're unlikely to get out of that that pool mm. because Saracens are trying to play the two competitions. They'll want to get all their points up at home to avoid relegation. And if they can qualify anyway for Europe, come April 1st, they get a quarter final, then they can throw all their eggs into that basket because as long as they're not going to be relegated, then they'll focus on Europe and that'll make it hard for everyone. I'm struck by something Jerry Flannery said on some podcast or other that I listened to at some stage, uh, that you can change the coaches all you like, but you can't change the players. And that for all Larkham is very highly rated and Graham Rantry is um, an excellent uh, scrum coach. Um, and this is Flannery who's worked with players for the last three or four years. He's like, you still have only got the raw materials you have and they're yeah. still making too many mistakes within the system. Mm -hmm. So you think of the one where Farrell knocks it on off his chest. They just didn't get their lines of running quite right. Now it looked 
a lovely shape to it and it looked like a lovely move and, and it did end up with a player going over and it, you know, it, it, had it not spotted the, the knock on, it was fine. But there was a few of those moments. There was players, there was two box kicks came off, or two kick clearing kicks came off players' backs. Mm. There was malls messed up. And even tactically, I thought, I, 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 didn't, I don't know who won the toss, but they kind of played the, 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 the wrong, the, the, it was always going to be dry in the first half and went in the second half. And they played with the wind in the first half. And they never really did plug the corners in the old Ron Nagara fashion, even though they had four line-out forwards. Mm. And Saracens had Will Skelton playing in the second row, who you can't really lift. Mm. So they won four against the head, but they weren't in the right places. So they just, like, they won the game. They beat Saracens yeah. with a couple of really good players in, in the team. And they're still in the hunt. But unless they tighten up those decisions, unless they get every Like, Munster are a team that needs to get everything right to win big games when it comes to the business end of this tournament and they're in the business end of their own tournament now in the next two fixtures away to Saracens and Racing and if they still keep making those mistakes as well as the things that Matt's already pointed out yeah. they're just not there and, and no, you know I think they can win a for, Pro 14 this season but I really just don't think they're at and it's a part of the fact that they've changed coaches in the middle of the you know the Johan, Johan van Graan era yeah. that they're trying to bed in new stuff and they're giving the players all the detail and stuff but I mean it's all kind of kind of coming out in the performances. There's, there's good stuff there, but it's not enough good stuff. And it should just be a bit more now, even because accepting Matt's observations on their defence, Saracen scored three points at Thomond Park, they shouldn't be getting a losing bonus point. You yeah. know? It just can't be happening. Uh, Ulster 25, Harlequins 24. Needless to say, John Cooney's at the centre of the action here. Dan McFarland said, we've got Harlequins away and then we have to play Claremont away. If we play like we played here in this game over at the Stoop, we have not got a chance of winning. We are not consistent. I'm not complaining about that. I don't think we should be consistent at this stage, were his interesting comments. So they're away, they're away to Harlequins on uh, Friday and then they'll be away to Claremont and they'll have Bath at home in the final round. On Cooney, briefly, Matt, I think everybody's noticed his form because it's kind of impossible not to. The thing that really occur encourages me about Cooney over the last couple of years is he is most definitely, categorically, a big game player. He really likes it. He likes pressure, he likes kicks at the end, he's done it nu numerous times, he likes big crowds. Uh, that points to a guy who could even go to another level in an Irish jersey. Especially uh, if the specialist comes back and says some bad news about Johnny Sexton's knee because you're going to need a goal kicker. Uh, and he is a top flight goal kicker, as we have seen week after week at certain times. His game has improved enormously in the last 12 months, uh, and he's benefiting from starting, obviously, against high-quality opposition. And he's this type of player that is competitive, and he's lifting his game each week for that, and he believes in himself. He backs himself. We saw that in that solo try going down the short side there against Claremont. Um, it'll be interesting to give him time. It's a, it's, it's a giant step up from Ulster where they are at now to saying to play international top-line Six Nations rugby. That's that's a big step. Uh, now, Connor Murray still hasn't... is not setting the, the world on fire. Connor can kick. And I think a lot of the selections around Cooney... I think well, Personally, I think Cooney will, will be uh, in the Six Nations... Whether he starts or not, I think will depend on Sexton because they'll need a kicker and that could be the reason they put him in there. Yeah. Now, the other side of that is if you think what Ulster are doing, they are relying on Cooney to get him out of trouble because they are missing tackles. They are like There was a couple of really soft tries they let in the other night, really soft. And there was a couple of absolutely incredible acts of bravery in defence and a couple of great tries. Like They threw an intercept pass. Ulster threw an intercept pass a metre out from Harlequin's uh, try line. And the, the intercept was going to go the length of field. And somehow Henderson ran 70 metres back and made the tackle. Like the Ulster players are playing for the jersey, playing for each other. The effort is there. But I guess it's a bit like Rory's comments on Munster, but a lot more. There's just way too many errors in defence and attack from Ulster for us to really say, look, they're going to be there at the bottom end, the top end of the season. Mm. But, you know, they, I really admire them. They're trying their guts out. And you almost can't ask any more of them because they, they're probably not capable of putting in a lot more than they're doing at the moment because they, they, I don't think there's any more in the tank. And I really admire their coach and the team for doing that. If, they, if you've got a team that's given you all, well, what else can you say as a coach? Mm. Like, they're, they're doing it. I know what Dan's saying. He doesn't want them to make those mistakes. But if they didn't have Cooney, with, as you say, with ice in his veins, 
slotting the ball right down the centre of the post with, you know, 40 seconds or 30 seconds to go on the clock, they'd be, they would have lost a number of games. Mm. There's that. There's the Stockdale intercept away to Bath. I mean, things are going their way, but yeah. you ride it while you can. You were at Gloucester 26, Connick 17. Yeah. The reverse of that will be on Saturday, 12.45. Half time, we thought, OK, this is going all right. Without your sense in the ground, no? Not really. Well, look, on the scoreboard, yes, they were winning the game. Um, it was it felt like a Challenge Cup match. It was a really... I think maybe having seen this particularly the first half in Northampton and Leinster the day before, the quality that was on show, this was a much more... It was, it was, it was like you were... You, uh, put it on kind of like, you know, when you play a podcast a little bit slower, or, like Leicester was played on the, a much higher speed. It was just a different pace. It was a lot more errors. And Connacht really kind of white, white knuckled their way through that first half. They won a kind of couple, couple of turnovers on their own line. They gave up a couple of really big line breaks. They're still missing bodies and they can't afford to because they have the thinnest squad of all four provinces. And Gloucester scored the first try really, really easily and should have had a second, but for a really good play by John Porch, who's come in and done really well for them. Um, and he went up and scored a try and they got ahead and Gloucester started getting frustrated because it wasn't coming as easy. Mm. But you kind of knew with Cipriani pulling the strings and that big um, big Gloucester pack kind of rumbling, they had a couple of malls that were big, that really Connacht had been hanging on a little bit and that the second half was a little bit inevitable. Um, Colby Finn got injured, he's probably been Connacht's best player this season. He's a really important, fairly unheralded player, um, Australian um, A international. And when they lost him, Copeland came on, didn't really affect the game too much. It, it just was kind of inevitable that Gloucester were going to get ahead and win it. And they're left with, now Connacht are left with four points. They've got Gloucester at home this weekend, but then they've got three Interpros before round five. And really, those three Interpros are bigger games for them because they need to get, if they want to get into the playoffs in the Pro 14 and get back to this level next season, Andy Friend said, effectively said, they have to get there. And the big worry from an overall perspective is that Jack Carty's not playing well. And as Matt referenced, Johnny Sexton's out. Joey Carberry's out. He's the only World Cup surviving out half, but he's getting replaced after 52 minutes by a kid in Conor Fitzgerald who's playing better than him. And, and ask Andy Friend about it afterwards. He said, "Look, the guy. You know, he's, he, you can see he's not playing well. He's he's not. He was the man last season. He's not the man right now. And Conor Fitzgerald's playing better than him. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Conor Fitzgerald's going to come in a lot over Christmas and." You know, Ireland have a bit of a problem at out half as a result. So, um, so Johnny Sexton has seen a specialist yeah. today, and we're hearing Carberry will be back over Christmas. That's the hope, but I mean, Carberry needs to demonstrate an ability to play back to back for a few weeks before we can have any real faith in his ability to play in the Six Nations. But yeah, the hope is that Carberry comes in, and that will alleviate a lot of fears. Um, and Ross Byrne played really, really well. Uh, off the bench for Leinster um, and JJ Hanron's going quite well down in Munster as well so there are players who with very little international experience playing very well but Carty right now is the is the fit guy but he's not in form mm. so I mean once you see specialists on that Leinster like that you have to kind of decode Leinster medical bulletin sometimes particularly when Ireland the contracted Ireland players are involved once you see a player going for a second scan and consulting with a, spe a specialist you're looking at six to eight weeks minimum. Mm. Alrighty, fellas, we're pretty much out of time. Our Ruby coverage was with thanks to Vodafone, hashtag Team of Us, everyone in. Roy O'Connor of the Irish Independent, thank you. Matt, thanks sure. very much. Pleasure, guys. Nice to talk to you. Right. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team.